So um, if you look at today's environment in HIV, you can see one in which there's a number of effective treatment options that are relatively easy to tolerate. Um, many of those on effective treatment can approach something approaching a, a, a normal lifespan. We now also have study after study confirming that viral suppression has the added advantage of completely preventing the sexual transmission of HIV. That knowledge that U equals U, that is that undetectable equals untransmittable, has gained broad worldwide acceptance. Uh, the use of antiretrovirals by HIV negative people as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP has also been proven to provide very effective protection against HIV transmission. But of course, things were not always thus. When I was preparing for today, I went to the KD offices to flip through old issues of treatment update, that's sort of one of our flagship publications, to refresh my memory about the range of HIV research in the first 15 years of the epidemic, that would be just before the advent of combination therapy. I found issues going back to about 1989. There were studies of early antiretrovirals, AZT, DDI, DDC, and so forth, showing very limited effectiveness in mono or, or dual therapy that diminished over time, combined with really harsh, horrible side effects. There were studies of other existing drugs, revampin, acyclovir, interferons, gamma globulin, cimetidine, tamoxifen, in the hope that they would have antiviral or immune boosting effects. There were studies of natural products, shiitake mushrooms, licorice, beta carotene, paba, Chinese cucumber roots. There were completely out of the box examples like DNCB, uh, a chemical used in developing photography that uh, you would swab onto your skin in the hope that it would have immune boosting effects. Sometimes several of these approaches were combined in one trial. It really all resembled throwing handfuls of spaghetti at a wall to see which, if any of the strands would stick. Finding effective treatments for opportunistic infections was not much more successful. Pneumocystis pneumonia, Kaposi sarcoma, cytomegalovirus, Mycobacterium avium complex, toxoplasmosis, and other infections could all be very stubbornly resistant to existing treatments, and all of them could and did kill. But the perceived lack of progress in finding effective treatments was not the only problem. Even after breakthroughs in treatment began to emerge, the structures that, that existed to develop those treatments to bring them to market and to make them accessible to those who needed them did not and could not meet the needs of people living with HIV as the epidemic progressed and expanded. People living with HIV had to use a, com a combination of activism, advocacy and engagement to bring about change. Now, I don't mean to suggest that these changes came about solely because of HIV or the efforts of people living with HIV, but we were, as my long-term colleague and mentor Louise Binder described us, and this was in my notes before I saw that she was here today, she called us the canaries in the coal mine of the healthcare system because just by virtue of the frequency, urgency, intensity, and multiple points of contact with which we access healthcare, any choke points in the system or any barriers to access are almost certain to impact us and we need to find a way to overcome them in order to obtain the care that we need. It was because our experience could provide such a fulsome portrait of existing deficiencies, because our efforts were usually focused on the bigger picture rather than seeking HIV-specific solutions, because we took advantage of those few opportunities when people living with other diseases were willing to work with us or to forge ahead on our own when they were not, that we were able to advocate effectively for systemic changes that were to benefit everyone, not just people living with HIV. The rigidity of placebo-controlled clinical trials made them a crapshoot even when the agents being studied showed promise. Inclusion and exclusion criteria that often seemed arbitrarily restrictive and other barriers to participation also served to shut out many of those who were most in need of new treatment options. One particularly obscene example was a placebo-controlled trial of pentamidine for pneumocystis pneumonia in 1988, when US trials the previous year had already clearly established its effectiveness. Activists could and did lobby trial sponsors for compassionate access on a case-by-case -case basis, but this was, at best, a stopgap. People living with HIV demanded a voice in how clinical trials were designed and conducted. And this was achieved both through community advisory boards for individual trials and through the creation of a community advisory committee at the Canadian HIV Trials Network. The objections of people living with HIV made placebo control trials less and less acceptable. Eventually, amendments to both the Declaration of Helsinki and the Tri-Council Policy Statement codified restrictions on their use when effective treatments were available. Ooh, where is it? Two minutes? 
Um, in order to make clinical trials as accessible as possible, honoraria now need to be set high enough to cover the costs of travel and childcare. Inclusion and exclusion criteria are to be based on the scientific requirements of the trial rather than on any preconceived notions of the ability of certain populations to meet their responsibilities as study participants. Expanded access protocols became a standard component of clinical trials in order to permit access by those who might not meet inclusion criteria and or who had expended available treatment options. There was a recognition that anyone who accepted the risks of taking an experimental drug had earned the right to continue using it if it was deemed to be effective. Thus, it became effect accepted practice that anyone taking a drug in a clinical trial or through expanded access would continue to have access to the drug until it was listed on the appropriate public formulary. The question of how new and very expensive antiretrovirals and treatments for opportunistic infections would be paid for came to a head in the early 90s. Public drug coverage at the time was limited to the elderly and those on social assistance uh, and was slow to list new drugs and approve exceptions for drugs not yet listed. Desperation led to perverse outcomes such as forcing people to quit their jobs and apply for social assistance to obtain drug coverage. In some cases, doctors would hospitalize people at the cost in tens of thousands of dollars so that they could be treated with a few hundred dollars worth of a drug that would have otherwise been affordable to them, unaffordable to them. Uh, let's see, in two minutes, what can I do? So, uh, so eventually, Trillium Drug Program was launched to pretty much just in time for the HIV treatment revolution that was about to come. While by no means an ideal solution, it nevertheless brought the cost of treatments in reach for many who would otherwise have been unable to afford them. The advent of combination antiretroviral therapies in 1996 was unquestionably a game changer. It allowed many people living with HIV to literally rise from their deathbeds, yours truly included. But it was not without problems. Side effects made treatment difficult to tolerate, causing adherence challenges leading to resistance. Longer term effects included cardiovascular disease, kidney and liver damage, and metabolic disorders. Chronic diarrhea, peripheral neuropathy, telltale facial wasting impeded day-to-day -day living and social interaction. Because many of these side effects did not register in relatively short clinical trials, they were often dismissed or their consequences minimized by clinicians and researchers alike. Even when acknowledged, the message that many people living with HIV heard was that meds had saved their lives and so they had no real cause to complain. Organizations like CTAC took up the cause of building a more consumer-centered post-market surveillance system to some degree achieved, but people living with HIV had again made their voices heard and over time there was a shift in research to regimens that were simpler, caused fewer and less severe side effects and had higher barriers to resistance. Some challenges of course still remain. About 5% of people living on HIV treatment are unable to receive, achieve viral suppression because of accumulated resistance to existing therapies. The patchwork of public and private drug coverage across the country means that affordability issues persist both viral eradication and functional cures remain elusive in spite of a handful of case-specific successes and near misses. But clearly we are light years ahead of where we were even 20 years ago and I hope there could be something in our experience that others can see parallels with and can apply.